Um, we're ready for our final talk of the day from Fabian to talk about BSD certification. So I'll hand it over to you. All right. So um, I hope you can see some slides now. Not yet. Not yet. Hold on. Um, Hold on. I'll try to reassure. What about now? Yes. All right. So um, am I okay to get started? Yep. Okay, doc. So first of all, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And thanks for having me today. Thanks for staying around um, to listen and talk with me a little about it about the B in LPI, which was something that might not be absolutely obvious, but it's certainly there. And today I would like to tell you a little bit about the certification efforts API is doing regarding BSD, um, as well as about a little side project we're doing regarding learning materials um, with a special note about what we would like to do regarding BSD learning materials and where we could need some help and where we already have some stuff that just needs a review with a little bit of the hope that someone might volunteer to um, give us a hand. But that's for the end. So let's get started. First of all, who am I? My name is Fabian. I'm the Director of Product Development at Linux Professional Institute LPI. Um, I myself am pretty much someone with a technical background, although more or less by coincidence, it ended up being Linux and not BSD. Although these days, most of the technical stuff I'm doing is around cloud native infrastructure, Kubernetes, Docker, and all of the stuff that's surrounding that topic. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about LPI. So who are we? First of all, um, we are Canadian nonprofit around since 1999, so for quite a while. We are multilingual in terms of operating globally and translating stuff to numerous languages. I think we have around 30 or 13 or 14 languages, depending on what you look at, that we translate stuff to. Um, we are pretty much not as a certification body in terms of having certificates that we issue to people who pass a specific combination of exams. We are doing this in various dimensions. The low level dimension is the so-called essentials track where we're covering preliminary knowledge with the idea to provide something that schools and universities could use to both have a curriculum and to provide an initial credential to the students. Our main component is a three level Linux certification program with LPIC 1, LPIC 2 and LPIC 3 being consecutive certifications covering a lot of Linux content. But next to it, we have another track of professional certifications, which is the so-called open technology track. And that is where our BSD certification um, is placed along with a DevOps tools certification. As of today, more than 200,000 certification holders have passed our exams and earned a certification, and they are in more than 180 countries. So LPI is really like basically everywhere. But even though we are pretty much known for our certification program, technically we're in the um, we're in the phase of becoming an organization with a pretty different focus because we would like to become an organization representing anybody working in open source. LPI has become a membership-based organization, meaning anybody who owns one of our professional certifications, including the BSD one, can become a member of LPI in order to have a certain say and influence in how the organization is run, like for example, voting for our board of directors, but also in order to keep the certifications active by um, working um, in the field and earning so-called professional development units. Um, and we have a set of member benefits um, and several other reasons why it's really interesting to take a look at that membership program. So as I said, we are mostly known for our certifications, but that's by far not everything we're doing. One of the real big programs with an API or learning materials that I'll talk a little bit more um, in a couple of minutes. The learning materials are intended to, of course, help candidates prepare for our exams, but mostly to provide teachers some classroom ready utilities if they would like to educate their students about open source, be it Linux, be it web development, and hopefully someday, someday soon, also BSD. 
We have, of course, our exams and certifications. Um, I think that's nothing new. We have a series of partnership programs, for example, for approved training partners, for hiring partners, for publishing partners. We have the membership program that I just mentioned. We have volunteer programs. So there's a lot around the entire um, certification track. And is all of this what we're doing just Linux? And I think I already spoiled the answer. It's certainly not. I brought us the first sentence of our mission statement. And that is our mission is to promote the use of open source software by supporting the people who work with it. And as you see, it doesn't say Linux, well, it doesn't say BSD either, but it says open source. And I think that is a really great common determinator in a lot of technologies um, that are of interest. So how does LPI relate to BSD? First of all, LPI, even though it's called Linux Professional Institute, is about open source software. And we have already a series of products that are not really related to Linux. Um, basically, two months ago, we launched a new product called Web Development Essentials. It is an exam covering the most fundamental skills in software development. And we have chosen to use web development and JavaScript as the reference implementations again, because that's a common determinator that any or most of the modern applications developed these days will have at least on the front end. And the idea here is to provide a curriculum that can be used to introduce students into the progress of software development so that they have an idea about what is a variable, what is a loop, what is a condition, but with enough meat on the bones to really develop a little application that does a little something so that it's encouraging that it's hands on. And that is the idea that we have with all our um, essential certifications. And the web development essentials exam, for example, is totally agnostic of Linux. It could entirely be done and passed on a BSD system too. We have another certification on the essentials track coming up, which is security essentials, that again has zero dependencies to Linux. We have our DevOps tools engineer, although that includes quite a bit of container technologies that is not absolutely Linux free, um, but it has a lot of tools that can be used on, on any similar platform as well. And we would like to, to be a valuable member and to be of use for the LPI community as well. First of all, um, we have a BSD certification, as I've mentioned, and this certification qualifies anybody who passed it for API membership. So anybody who owns this credential can become an API member and, like I said, vote for our board of directors. We would also like to help people getting started to use and learn BSD, um, especially with um, our learning materials that, as we'll see shortly, are different to the normal textbook in terms of just enabling teachers to really transmit that knowledge. And of course, we want to continue to provide credentials for the LPI, for the um, BSD community that are of high quality and a lot of value. When you think about certifications regarding BSD, you might recall the BSD certification group that used to have the BSD associate exam and certification. In December 2017, the BSD certification group joined LPI with the idea of bundling our efforts in order to make the BSD certification easier available um, and basically bring it to the LPI infrastructure so that the efforts for maintaining and publishing it um, can leverage what we already have in LPI. The BSD associate, like the former BSD certification group exam, was stopped in 2018, but LPI continues to support it for anybody who earned that credential. We reached out to all of the credential holders and offered them to have their credentials transferred to LPI's credential management system. So it's still possible to prove the possession of this certificate. And on request, we issued the BSD specialist, like the um, following um, exam for BSD on request to those who have earned the BSD associate certification. The BSD specialist, like the newer one, that is on LPI's open technology track. We had to do a couple of adjustments to it. First of all, because we had to fit it into LPI's exam um, format so that we can deliver it along with our other exams, which means that we have a bit of fewer questions and a bit of less time in the new exam, but we also spent a lot of work in doing item writing. So we wrote a lot of additional items, um, some items with a little bit of more um, trying to transfer knowledge instead of just asking, asking straight for something to um, provide a little bit more context, which was something that is basically like specific to LPI that we are asking um, a little bit more about the surrounding than other certification bodies. And the entire item pool underwent um, quality assurance and we did the entire psychometrics analysis um, and statistics for the entire item pool. 
There was no grace period because the um, BSD associate exam was already discontinued when our new exam was launched. But as I've said, we offered um, any existing certification holder to bring their BSDA certification to LPI. And if they are interested in membership, um, get the BSD specialist certification though they quali so they qualify for membership. Now, what is this exam about? The overall audience are professionals working with one of the major BSD systems. Um, we focus on a rather technical skill set. So most likely the certification holder is data center or server administrator or support engineer, but someone who's working on the command line who's getting their hands dirty by using those systems and actually implementing stuff of it. The so-called minimally qualified candidate. So this is, this is a statistical model of the person who's barely supposed to pass the exam. So if this person knows anything less than defined in the statistical model of the MQC, that person is supposed to fail the exam. Whereas anything they know just at this point or above qualifies them to get the certification. Um, and that's a verbal description of the minimally qualified candidate. Although the details are statistics and statistic model, but the verbal, um, the verbal description is that the certification holder is a BSD system engineer and the certification holder is expected um, to apply their skills on free BSD, open BSD, and net BSD. So we have, of course, a lot of stuff that's common, but also a lot of specialties on the exam. And for various reasons, it's one exam that covers those three main BSD, um, BSD um, systems, basically because further dividing it into three different exams would be a giant effort and further narrowing down the audience that we have. And on the other hand, we found that a lot of people um, who are technically able to operate one system um, have a pretty easy time learning about the other ones as well. The entire certification consists of a single exam, which was different to the LP exams where we have two exams, um, but for the BSC specialist, passing that single exam is enough. It has 60 questions that have to be answered in 90 minutes. And all of those questions are multiple choice questions, either with a single answer, with multiple correct answers, or fill in the blank items. But for all of those questions, we specify what we expect. So if we don't specify anything, it's always a single correct answer. If it's anything different, there's an explanation in the answer, which usually tells you, for example, like choose two correct answers, choose three correct answers, or provide the name of the command without any path or parameters. So we are pretty straight in what we expect the candidate to answer. The topics on the exam, I won't read them all, all out loud because you can certainly go to our website to, to have a look yourself. Um, just the topics, so we're covering the BSD installation, software management, that is where we have the most variety in between the various BSD systems. We cover storage devices, file systems, a lot of system administration like user administration, um, logging, sending emails, printing stuff, managing user sessions, um, understanding the internet protocols, configuring them, configuring routing, configuring DNS, and um, a set of like common unique skills, like for example, working with processes, working with the text editor, um, being able to um, work with files, set ownership, stuff like that. Anybody who's qualified to do those tasks can easily um, get the certification just by taking the exam. So we don't require any specific training to be done or any specific program to be taken. It's really, we care about the skills. We don't care about how they were obtained. Um, yeah, like I said, it's a single exam. It qualifies for membership um, and it's on the open technology track. Um, it's available in English as of now, and we're delivering it on the PSNU testing centers and um, hopefully someday soon again in paper-based exams. Um, that was the way we used to do this before, before COVID, and we hope that one day we can do this in a responsible manner again when we gather physically instead of having remote meetings. Now, Exams are not the only thing we're doing. And just because the exams focus on the skills and ignore how they are obtained, we want to help people to actually obtain the exam. And that is what our learning materials project is about. So the learning materials, of course, are intended to prepare for the exams, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is that when, not whenever, but most of the times we talk to teachers about why they don't include more open source components in their classes and in their um, courses, we usually hear that it's hard to teach because a lot of materials have to be developed, whereas for proprietary software, a lot of those materials exist. 
and the big vendors do do a lot of work in order to make it as easy as possible for a school to adopt to what they are doing. And we want to, to try to fill that gap in order to provide something that is classroom ready so that the average, average teacher who has already a super busy schedule and zero time to prepare something has a key term solution to teach our technologies, to teach free technologies, um, to enable their students to have an own opinion about what kind of technology they would pursue in their careers. We don't have any technical requirements, except that we want um, a Linux or a BSD system um, to be around when the candidates try to work with the materials, because they include practical exercises, but we don't require, for example, signing up for an account with a specific cloud vendor or something. We're doing a lot of translations. Most of the materials are available in a set of languages. It depends a little on where you look at, but um, we're working with at least 10 different target languages, some of them published, some of them are in the works. Um, and it's a giant community project. We have a lot of people who write lessons. We have a lot of people who review lessons. We have a giant pool of um, translators who help to um, both translate. And of course, whenever there's someone translating something, they spot more things to be fixed. So it's a project where we're doing a lot of work on those materials with a lot of ongoing improvements um, in a continuous release cycle. So we're doing updates to that website and to those materials um, almost every day. So there's a lot of movement in that area. The materials are available for free for non-commercial use. Um, and we offer our training partners um, to get, for example, co-branded materials that they can use um, in a training setting, even if it's commercial. Um, the central place to see those materials is learninglpi.org. That is the central place that we established for any kind of exam preparation. Of course, we have our own learning material there, but we also maintain a catalog of third party publications related to our exams, mostly from our approved training partners, but we're also adding other material that we find. And there's a little indicator of the publisher um, actually is an LPI training on LPI publishing. Um, partner. And that website provides an overview about the people who wanted to be on that website who helped in the development of the materials. And that is intended as a little incentive for those who would like to be visible um, after they helped in that project, because the individual lessons are not attributed to someone, but anybody who wants credit can be on our contributors page. The materials follow the structure of our exams. So our objectives are organized into topics and objectives, basically like, um, like those um, sites that you saw here, right? So this would be, for example, um, a topic, and then we have those um, objectives underneath. And our materials follow that structure. So basically, the outline of the exam is the outline of the material as well. Depending on the weight that every um, objective has, we have one, two, three lessons for every topic. Those lessons are independent, meaning that they do not build on each other. So it's possible to pick anyone and just do that specific lesson. Um, we don't require a specific kind of system, but we require a playground like, for example, a Linux virtual machine or BSD virtual machine to test what we ask in those um, exercises. All of those lessons follow a specific structure. They have an introduction explaining what the topic is about, and explaining the most important commands and the principles. Then we have a set of so-called guided exercises. Those guided exercises are supposed to be solvable just by following with what was in the introduction. And then we have the explorational exercises that go beyond. They ask for stuff where the candidate would have to do some own experiments or would have to do some additional research on their own. And this distinction is something that is very important for teachers. Um, it's called differentiation, where you have some students who already get bored while the others are still searching for the pencil. And the guided and exploration exercises allow teachers to have an answer so that there's a bit of achievement and a moment of success to anybody passing the guided exercises along with the explorational exercises um, to entertain those who enjoy um, more content in the same time. There's a summary and there are the answers um, to both sets of exercises and they are always aligned in that order. So a teacher, for example, would have the ability to first of all do the introduction, hand out the guided exercises to everybody, hand out the explorational exercises to those who are done in order to focus the attention of their um, students. And this is a principle and a concept that we are applying to all of our learning materials. And we received great feedback um, from all of the teachers using this, at least those who reached out to us. So apparently this is something that is considered helpful um, and it's different to the normal textbook that you would find. 
the exercises are designed in a way that they can be both used in the classroom setting, but there are also a lot of self learners who enjoy having a specific path through the material. Um, having those introductions and having exercises they could follow up on. And yeah, those are basically also our target audiences um, with teachers being the ones um, who actually raised that issue, but a lot of others who benefit from it. Like I said, it's released um, for non-commercial use um, under a Creative Commons license. We do not allow derivatives as for now because we want to make sure that we can cycle back any kind of improvements. What we saw earlier that people just copy the materials into their own learning um, learning management systems, and then they are in there forever. And if we fix something, those fixes never get adopted. And that is the reason why we encourage people um, to not create derivatives, but help to do stuff upstream so everybody benefit. And we are absolutely open to any kind of um, of bug reports, to any kind of translations. Um, we take what we get. So if there's anybody offering, for example, a translation to another language, um, we immediately um, allow them to join us. Um, we grant them access to the required repositories and provide guides on how to work with those components. The repositories I've mentioned are one of the key um, places that we use for collaboration with our contributors. Um, they all work in Git. Um, we have a GitLab instance where we're managing all of this. The material themselves are written in ASCII doc. We do have a style guide. We do have a mailing list where authors um, and reviewers can discuss openly um, about any aspect they see. And internally within the um, review and publishing process, we use again GitLab. We have a lot of issue boards where we track the progress of stuff. Um, we're using Hugo, which was a static web framework to build the learning API or website. So it's a totally static site built with Hugo out of the ASCII doc documents. Um, we use Omega T to manage the translations of those materials. And we have a Docker based publishing process where basically, whenever, even if you're just fixing a single comma or a single typo, we're rebuilding the entire site uh, with a new container and we deploy that one. And we also have a set of specific Docker images that we use for PDF rendering that we just run when there's a specific change to a certain document. And that's basically the technical workflow, meaning that anybody who is able to write ASCII doc and who's able to commit something to a good repository following our style guide is able to contribute in any of the various roles, including um, writing content, including um, doing reviews, fixing issues. And when you take a look to learningapr.org, you will see that we have materials for Linux essentials, for web development essentials, for app one stuff on Epic 2 is in the works, but you won't see BSD there as of now. And that is something that we would like to change. We hope that we can reuse a lot of the stuff that already exists for Epic 1, especially regarding the various lessons that we have, because a lot of stuff like, for example, permission management, um, that is stuff that is basically the same. But we will never just rubber stamp it in terms of saying we are Linux folks and we think it's like that. So we definitely do need subject matter experts coming from the BSD community, helping us into reviewing this, making sure this is actually applicable to BSD. There are no specialties. There is nothing that's Linux specific that was left over. Um, we, we do need BSD natives, so to say, that help us to sort out what is correct, what is not correct, and that help us to produce those components that are unique to BSD. For example, anything related to software installation, software management, hardware configuration. We found that the BSD documentation is very well structured, at least compared to a lot of other stuff I saw. I found myself very lucky reading, um, reading through those documentations. So um, yeah, thanks to, to all of you who had creating that one um, and this is something that definitely is a giant help for anybody trying to start, for example, exploration exercises where they need to find accurate, easy to digest information that goes beyond what's in our normal learning materials. So long story short, we are looking for authors, we're looking for reviewers with a solid BSD background who would like to help us to work on those materials. Um, and I think that leveraging the existing Epic One materials would make this really easy because there's a lot of stuff around that needs to be reviewed and minimally adjusted. Um, and of course, there's a bit of stuff to create, but that's that's not comparable to doing it for an entire exam from scratch. So how can you help? Contributing to LPI is possible in various ways. 
Um, again, our main mission is to encourage people to use free and open source software, which absolutely includes BSD. So for that matter, we need more BSD expertise with an LPI. Um, and that especially includes the learning materials because um, access to this knowledge is key for anybody using this, for anybody who would like to um, get the certification. But of course, we also have to maintain our certification. So we also need people to write new um, exam items, to review exam items, maybe even have translating them. So if we want to provide any product that is valuable for the community, that is of a real benefit, we need support and we're looking for those contributors. If you consider helping out here and there. Um, a brief overview about the various um, ways how to engage with LPI. Anybody who's interested in our exam development in the early stages of it, um, we do have a public mailing list. That's the exam development mailing list. And that is where we discuss um, especially updates to the objectives. So whenever the exam is due for review, which usually is um, depending on the schedule, somewhere between every three to every five years, that is the mailing list where we're discussing all of the potential changes um, and where we're collecting um, opinions, ideas to make sure that we don't oversee anything and to make sure that we still reflect what is actually required and covered in the field. So anybody who would like to join those discussions, please sign up. In general, we allow traffic, except for when we start discussing about new objectives for a specific exam. Then we do have some more traffic on that list. But again, that's not spamming your inbox. And most of that is actually worth reading it. Um, so if you would like to be involved in the development of the exam objectives and getting an early idea about what's coming next, that is the place to describe. Once we decided on um, where a certain exam goes, depending on the amount of change, we do a so-called job task analysis. That is a public survey where we engage any professional working in the related field to rank various tasks. So we provide a long list of stuff people could do, and we ask for a rating regarding how important that task is and how often it is executed by the potential minimally qualified candidate. And we use this information to ultimately decide what is on the exam and what is the weight of those topics. Um, we need to define the objectives, um, like the outline that you saw before. We need to do all of the item writing, which can be quite a lot of work. And actually, from, from my perspective, the hardest part is finding the wrong answers. Like, it's easy to ask something and not the right answers, but finding four more answers that are kind of plausible but still wrong, that is a real challenge in there. Um, all of this needs to be reviewed, um, ideally by two, at least two um, individuals on the technical side and two individuals on the language side. We do a so-called angle of study where we're determining the, um, the complexity and um, the, um, the hardness of every single question in order to be able to provide equally complicated exams. We do psychometric analysis. As, um, we have beta exams, we translate everything, we publish anything. So that is the entire process and we welcome, we welcome help on any of those stages. Anybody who would like to help in that regard, becoming a subject matter expert for our exams, um, could help, for example, by creating objectives, writing exam questions, review exam questions, translate exams. They would have to sign an NDA because they would be handling actual exam content. And of course, we're offering a financial compensation. LPI itself is a nonprofit, so we have to get rid of our money, so to say. Um, and you certainly won't get rich doing this work, but it's a little compensation for the time and the efforts put in there. Um, for the learning materials, we have three major roles, which are authors, reviewers, and translators. Um, here we are more liberal in terms of NDAs, for example, because we publish anything anyway, so there's no need to sign an NDA. Um, same for translators. For exams, we have to make sure that we have high quality right from the start because we publish an exam is expensive and that's a lot of work, whereas fixing an error in the learning materials is super easy. So here we're more liberal in terms of um, how many people work in there in terms of um, the amount of reviews we do. We have manuals for any of those um, steps. We have a mailing list, as I've mentioned. If you'd like to, you can, you can get your image and a little bio on our contributors page. And again, there is a small compensation, at least to, to give a little bit in return for the time and the efforts that are put into this. Um, if you think that those learning materials, for example, would be a great help for, for the BSD community, and if you have a bit of time and if you think you could help us, for example, doing some edits or helping to write one or the other lesson, please send an email to me and I either 
respond directly to you or um, measure up with Marcus, um, who is the person in charge of our learning materials program. We would be really happy for anybody who would like to, to give us a hand. And that brings us to the last part. If we have any questions or any ideas or any feedback, I um, hope I'm not too early. I prepared for half an hour, um, assuming that, that we have a bit of time to discuss or to let you guys start your weekend early. And yeah, that was what I've prepared. Anybody who would like to say something or ask something? Well, thank you for your presentation. I'll give a few minutes to see if any questions come up. Um, mm -hmm. I think I saw one earlier on IRC. Let me scroll back and find it. It's a reference to, to, I guess earlier you had referenced 20,000. Um, and the question was, does the 20,000 um, things reference, is it specific to Linux or does it also include BSD? That includes all of them. Okay. And then we have another question from um, uh, Sato-san. This question is, what is the best way for an event or conference organizer to approach LPI? Um, so I should give you some background. Sato-san organizes mm -hmm. a, a, a annual conference in Asia that's um, mm -hmm. on BSD. Um, so conference organizers are interested in on-site certification exam, wow. exams. Um, and he's saying previously we had on-site exams with the BSD CG folks, um, or also how to advertise exams in the future. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest way is to just send an email to, to our normal um our normal API address, um, info at lpi.org, and we'll triage it internally. Um, it depends a little on the region because we have various, uh, various people in various locations, um, but we will do our very best to find a proctor who is nearby, and we have a pretty good network of proctors all around the world. And ideally, if it's like an on-site event, um, paper-based exams would be the easiest approach. We would, of course, advertise it on all our channels um, in terms of social media. It might even be possible if that fits into the event to also offer the normal um, LPI exams and especially the essential exams, because that, that normally attracts a lot of candidates who just come by by saying, hey, like the exam fee is just half to what I would pay in the testing center. So if I go to that event, I would have my travel expenses and pay the same, but I get the event for free. So um, that is something that we can definitely arrange. And you could either reach out to LPI or send me an email um, in case you want to take a screenshot and I will redirect your, you to the right person that's responsible for doing event management in that region. But we're absolutely open to that and we are, we are happy to, to offer um, exams anywhere where we, have, where we have a couple of candidates who would like to take them. Another question um, over in the Zoom chat uh, from Roller Angel asks, can you talk more about the learning materials? Are they provided <laughs> to people before they take the exam? Um, yes, they are accessible for anyone. And in fact, you can even use them if you're, even if you do not attend the exam at all. Um, hold on a second. I can, I can show you a bit on how they look like. Um, although I have to change my screen. I hope that doesn't screw anything. Hold on. Give me a second. <laughs> that was strange. One more try. For some reason, I got an open browser and I can find it. I will just do this and share the entire screen. So I think you can see a browser window now, correct? Yep. All right, so this is the Learning LPI org site. And if you click on Learning Materials and go to LPI Learning Materials, you can just take a look. So this is what is currently really released on the English um, side. And for example, if you go to Web Development Essentials, um, 
you could either download the PDF version up here, um, or you could browse um, through the objectives. So for example, if we say we want to learn more about JavaScript programming and maybe about control structures and functions, we could go to the first lesson. Um, and this lesson um, has the outline as we mentioned earlier, in terms of we have the introduction that explains um, a lot of this stuff. And if we scroll further down, we find the exercises. Um, and that's quite a long lesson. So it's a lot to learn. And right, so here we have the guided exercises, the exploration exercises, the summary and the answers to it. And something that is that is um, a little bit invisible are the various translations. So for example, what is this? Um, so for example, if, if we click up here, can you see, hold on. So, Let's give this one more try. <laughs> All right, so now you should be able to see my screen again. So this is the overall outline. If you click on this one here, here you can see the various translations only for this specific lesson. So if I click on German, for example, here I get the entire thing in German. And if I prefer Italian, for example, um, that is just a click away. If you would like to get an overview about where we are, um, you could you could probably go to the English version. So we can probably find it. We have a roadmap up here. And this roadmap shows what exams like uh, what materials and works and what languages we have prepared so here you can see um, for example stuff that's in the works um, stuff that is already partially released and this is available to anybody who would like it so if you're for example a teacher or a professor and you would like to take that stuff to school um, it's super easy to just take it even if you are not preparing your students um, for an exam, even if you only want to take a couple of lessons and combine them with something different. Um, try to stick to the license. If you spot anything, report it back to us so we can fix it upstream for you. Um, but this is available to anybody for free who's interested in using it for their own purpose. And if anybody's interested um, in um, becoming an API partner, for example, if you're a test at training center and you would like to get those materials co-branded uh, with the permission to use it in a commercial setting, um, you can easily become a training partner, proof training partner, and um, yeah, get those materials. Okay, <clears throat> so another question we had, sorry, from IRC, um, uh, and I'll, I'll just read the question as they wrote it, um, is how do you find a balance between, um, in quotes, trick questions and leading questions, and kind of how do you structure the questions that you ask? Mm, that's a good one. Um, so we try to make every exam equally complicated and we have questions of both types one thing we do is the so-called um, angle study the angle study works like this we have a set of subject matter experts usually around 10 to 15 and they get to review every single question and for every single question they can of course object if they consider them technically incorrect but if they don't object they have to provide a guess how many percent of the minimally qualified candidate, right? The person who's supposed to, to barely pass the exam will get that specific item right. And then we see, once all got the ratings in, for every single item we see, are they somewhat equally or do they vary a lot? And then we have a second round where we only take a look at those items where we had a certain variance. And all SMEs see in an, like an anonymized manner the other votes. So they see comments that the other participants left, and they also see their ratings. And then they have the ability to adjust their very own rating um, depending on the like comments and the other's opinions. And this allows us for any potential combination of exam items to determine how complicated the exam is, the specific exam in terms of the specific combination of items. Um, we make sure that we have. Um, that we have a similar ratio between like straight questions and questions asking for more context. Um, 
but we also weight the exams in a way that they are all equally complicated. That is, for example, why we say you can get up to 800 points in the exam and you need 500 points to pass the exam, but it's not always the same number of items you have to get right in order to get those 500 points, because that depends on the exact combination that you have in your specific exam. And that is based on those psychometric data, um, how we try to ensure that every exam is equally complicated. And the other thing is, even when we ask for context, all of our items have a clear right uh, or wrong answer. So we do not ask, for example, what is the best way to do something or which is the least complicated way, because that includes a lot of judgment and we're not doing these kind of questions. Like even if we ask for context, like saying, for example, um, that we describe a specific requirement of an application and then we provide various potential ways of how to achieve that specific um, requirement. Then there's always, depending on the answer type one or two, which are explicitly right and the others are explicitly wrong. So there's always something that makes them absolutely right or wrong. So there's no, no good judgment in those items. Um, and that is something where we spent a lot of effort, both in item writing as well as in the review process to make sure that every item has a clear right or wrong answer and there's there's no discussion about how to interpret a specific item even if they are more complicated in terms of like being more text in order to ask for a little bit of knowledge transfer um, that won't be the majority of the exams i hope that kind of answered it but feel free to to ask more no i think that was a good answer how to I think that might have been all the questions we had today. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thank you for all our folks um, who've come to our conference over the last couple of days. This is actually the last talk. So this is uh, the end of our conference for this, this summer for the, the Freebie State Developer Summit. So I had a couple of things I was going to go over as we kind of wrap up. So first of all, um, FreeBSD Day is June 19th. So I think that's like in two days, um, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, so that's FreeBSD's anniversary. So happy birthday to FreeBSD. So celebrate with us all week long. There's going to be events. Um, you can see on the foundation's website, they have a list of what's going on uh, this week. So follow along with that. Um, also, we have several uh, FreeBSD summits coming up in person. Um, and we're excited about that. Um, the next one is going to be at EuroBSDCon in Vienna and Austria. I will be there along with several other folks. So that's during the kind of first two days of EuroBSDCon on September 15th and 16th. In addition, folks are, are going to be meeting in Aberdeen, Scotland for an Aberdeen Hackathon in October um, that you're welcome to attend. Uh, Tom Jones is going to be hosting that along with some other folks. And then a, another one that's coming up, we don't have a date yet, but sometime during the fall, um, we'll be having a free risky vendor summit again in the Bay Area in California. Um, and most likely we expect this one to be in person uh, this year. So we'll be excited at these places to meet some of you folks um, in person and have a chance to see each other face to face. Uh, lastly, thank you for coming. Thank you for attending, um, for participating in our talks and our sessions. Uh, thank you for all the speakers who gave talks and planned ahead. Um, please do tell us uh, what you thought, both as speakers and attendees. Uh, we've had a survey in the links here. We've also put it in IRC and Slack and some other places. Uh, if you could please fill it out, it's only a couple of questions that will help us with planning future summits. Um, and also, lastly, I wanted to thank um, once again the team that helped plan and organize this, um, Anne and Deb and Lauren and Ed, uh, that really helps all the stuff that goes together. Um, and thank you to the foundation for sponsoring this. They covered the costs that we did have with using, um, for example, spatial.chat for the hallway track. Um, and speaking of that, um, folks are welcome to hang out in the hallway track um, after our official program is over. Uh, I know I'll be there probably for a bit. 
Uh, so if you need to want to just go hang out and talk some more, if there are things we didn't quite finish talking about in the conference, that's the place to meet up. So until then, I'll see y'all folks um, next time we meet in person. So thank you all. <laughs>